Good morning. morning. I think we'll open with yet another prayer because we need all the prayer that we can get. Father God, we are your children. Sometimes we are very weak, small children, crying when life hurts and afraid of the terrors by night. Open our eyes, let us see you. For we know that if we once see you in your grace and glory, we will never want to see anything else. For as long as you have use for us here in this world, make us content to stay. And when you have triumphed over the darkness, let us live with you in the light. I have heard many people saying that they believe the day of the Lord may be near. Certainly, we see many signs of it, especially the falling away mentioned in 2 Thessalonians. And it may be that indeed we are in the end times. My message to you today is what you see depends on where you look. So perhaps we should look a bit at what the Bible says about the day of the Lord. I'll be working primarily with Joel chapter two. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord cometh. It is nigh at hand, a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness as the morning spread over the mountains. A great people and strong there hath not been Ever like, ever the like, neither shall there be another after it, even to the years of many generations. A fire devoureth before men, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. Now this is mirrored in Zephaniah, Chapter 1, the great day of the Lord is near. It is near, it hasteth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall weep bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of the trumpet and alarm, against the fenced cities and the high towers. The prophet Zechariah, and it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. They shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Where are the prophets looking? What are they seeing? What does the whole of scripture look toward? Jesus the Messiah. Further down in Joel is a familiar passage. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit, and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord is come. God gives us prophecy for us to use it to understand what he is doing. A great student of prophecy, John Walvoord, says, all true prophetic teaching has an application. The study of prophecy is not just for prophecy's sake. God has taught us concerning future things because he wants us to be informed. And being informed, to be better Christians. One of the reasons for presenting the doctrine of the imminent return of Christ is that it is an impelling motive to be living for him every day. 
There is no better reason for working for Christ, apart from real love of him, than the motive that we may see him today, that we may see him today. That should be the desire of all his followers. Indeed, Jesus may return for us at any time, perhaps before I step down from this pulpit. In 2 Peter, we read, and so we have the prophetic word made more sure to which we do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in the heavens. If we heed the lamp of the word, we will also, as he says, be looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. As to prophecies and parables, Jesus advises us to learn the parable from the fig tree as soon as its branches become tender and sprouts its leaves, you know that summer is upon you. So too, when you see all these things, recognize that he is near, right at the door. He teaches in mystery and parable, yes, but to the end that all mysteries will be made plain in time. And we know that he is indeed near, right at the door. In fact, right in the door with us in this room. In Colossians, even one mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations, but now is manifest to his saints, to whom God would make plain what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, there is something to take home and think about. You see, one of the dangers of living in the expectation of the end times is that we spend so much time looking at and dreading the devastation and the destruction. Remember how Joel put it, a fire devoureth before them and behind them a flame. The land is as the Garden of Eden before them and behind them a desolate wilderness. And that is why I say you are looking in the wrong direction. Turn your eyes from the fire and face instead the Garden of Eden. The philosopher Plato had an allegory about people chained in a cave. All they could see were the shadows cast on the wall of the cave in front of them, cast by malevolent persons who were in soul and manipulative control of what they could see. The shadows were what they thought were reality, but they were not accurate representations of the world. Even when one of the prisoners became free and discovered the real world outside the cave, the manipulators had darkened the minds of the people so that they could not perceive the truth and attacked the person trying to free them. This allegory has been used many times in literature. Um, recently, a movie called The Matrix is based on this theme. And Jesus was well aware of the tragedy of people who see, but do not perceive, who hear, but do not understand. The Holy Spirit indwelling us is the only reliable source of our light. In the word of God, we will always find the truth. In the world, we will find deception. What you see depends on where you look. All scripture references emphasize how terrible the day of the Lord will be. 
Isaiah calls it cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger. You will want to read Ezekiel, Zephaniah, Zechariah, and many others, including some two dozen references in the New Testament. It will be hideous. There will be fierce darkness and blood spilt to the depth of horses' bridles. And thus it will be for the unsaved. But we, who are the Lord's already, are already passed from death into life. We will witness despair around us, but we will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Hear the reassurance in Psalm 91. You will not be afraid by the, of the terror by night or the arrow that flies by day, of the plague that stalks in darkness or of the destruction that devastates at noon. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not approach you. You will only look on it with your eyes and see the retaliation against the wicked. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I say unto you, for you know yourselves, know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. This is from Colossians. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. And as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in the darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all children of the light, and children of the day. You are not of the night, not of the darkness. Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, we are to look forward to it because out of the destruction of all we know will come the new heaven and the new earth wherein righteousness dwells. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I'm reminded of an old gospel song. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. So what you see depends on where you look how hard is it to endure this present darkness when we see the alternative? The, what alternative was there for those fleeing the great horde in Joel 2? Yea, and nothing shall escape them. That particular implacable horde was a massive onslaught of locusts. Plagues of locusts occur throughout the Bible. The ones in chapter 9 in the book of Revelation are described as locust-like horsemen, very like the ones in Joel. They are a type of mindless attack, or rather a single-minded attack, one which can neither be reasoned with or negotiated with or intimidated. Sin is like that. You cannot negotiate with sin. Even when you repent, you still endure the consequences. God is not mocked for what you sow, you shall reap. And in Hebrews, have you forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are punished by him. Consider that God did not hesitate to chasten, to humble his own son. For he spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not also freely give us all things? And the son accepted this. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God. Behold, we count them happy, which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. And at the end of the little apocalypse in Matthew 24, we are told he that shall endure to the end shall be saved. 
So you see, it depends on where you look. And I think many are looking in the wrong direction. Theology is full of big words. I think this is a job security measure on the part of theologians. I see Carmen smiling there. It uh, is a warning off to the easily intimidated. Theology is not difficult. Every last one of you can do it, and you should. I read a lot because God has given me a gift for it, and I enjoy reading about the people who will be my neighbors in heaven. But really, you can find all you need in the Bible. I would trade all the technical terms for more Bible study and for us to read the Bible as the Bereans did. When they heard Paul and Silas, they received the word with readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so, and therefore many believed. Studying together is important. A concordance is especially useful. It's a book that tells you how to find a particular verse that you, it's on the tip of your tongue, but you just can't tell where it is. And if any of you don't have one, let me know. I have some out in the lobby. And if anyone is interested in Bible study, um, speak to the leadership or the deacons. But the most important tool is the one you already have at hand when you read with the guidance and light of the Holy Spirit. And when you have read, obey. First Samuel, hath the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. However, once you learn to think and make judgments, there's a downside to that. Other people are thinking and making their judgments as well. Have you ever been disappointed and felt betrayed, depended on someone who let you down, felt claustrophobic with the wickedness around you? The injuries done to the heart and to the spirit are just as devastating as fire and brimstone. I put it to you that betrayal is what you feel when you believe someone should have thought more of you than they did. Think about a job you failed to get, a lover you lost, a time when you experienced great disappointment and disillusionment. You say, if they had really loved me, if they had known of what worth I am, if they had understood. I'm telling you once again, you are looking in the wrong place. Look at God. He will never undervalue you. He put your soul in the balance against his son's agony, and he sent Jesus to the cross. And Jesus, the one who is altogether lovely, the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star, he went willingly, eagerly, for the joy that was set before him. You are beloved, cherished, worthy in the sight of God. Look in the right direction. Turn your back on destruction and betrayal and the things that do not satisfy. And walk into the Garden of Eden. Isaiah asked, can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even she may forget, but I will not forget you. Behold, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hand. Jesus has your name tattooed on those pierced hands. 
and he stretches them out to you. Take his hand, turn from the devastation, and face the day spring, the source of all light and love. If you have not turned your eyes upon Jesus, do it now and let today be the day of the Lord for you. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full on his wonderful face, and the things of earth will be strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Light of the world, you have our attention. We confess we have not loved you with a pure and single heart. We have not given you the obedience you desire above sacrifice. We have not done justice, loved kindness, or walked humbly with you, our God. We have been distracted and distressed by the things which are not you. Have mercy on us. In your great compassion, cleanse our blindness. Create in us a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within us. When you say, seek my face, may we say, we seek your face, Lord. Do not hide your face from us. Do not turn us away. You have been mankind's help in all generations. Do not abandon us or forsake us, God of salvation. For all else has forsaken us, but you will take us up. Draw us into the light of your love. To the praise of the glory of your grace. Amen. We're going to sing that song as a song of response. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. You'll find it in the red hymnal, 552. We're going to add the verses into it as well. O soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus as we sing, reflect on what we've heard, and draw from the hope, the love, the joy that comes in looking at Jesus. 252, what number? I don't know what I said, but anyway. Red Book 252, my bad. Yeah. 252. Thank you. 